All right, now let's talk about chapter 53, population ecology. The ecology of populations, that is, we're focusing on particular species um, that are living in pretty much the same area. And so we're going to look at all the different parameters that go into studying populations and their ecology. We can speak of the density of that population, which is fairly self-evident. It's the number per unit area. Um, and we can also speak of the dispersion of that species, which is the spacing of them across the uh, landscape. Um, now, with density, uh, there's various ways you can measure these kinds of things. Of course, with plants, you can simply go out and count them and see how many there are per unit area. Um, with animals, it's a little more difficult. Um, there's some techniques that um, you can use. There's this one called mark recapture. Um, I'll mention this in class a little bit. Now, of course, the size of the population is a function of various things. Um, of course, births and immigration add to the population. Deaths and immigration take away from the population. Um, a population might be in equilibrium where these things are sort of balancing out. There can be times in that population's history, it's particular years, where perhaps death rates increase and the population shrinks, or birth rates increase and the population increase, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so again, dispersion. Um, there are different ways of thinking about them. You can have a clumped dispersion, and that is they're sort of in little groups around the landscape. Um, living in little packs, if you will, like these wolf packs. You can have a uniform dispersion, where they're relatively equally dispersed across the landscape. The, the rookeries of marine animals, marine birds, like these uh, penguins, are like that. They sort of have their nests equidistant from each other for the most part. And of course, you can just have a random dispersion. There's no real pattern to it. Demography. This is the study of populations, population dynamics, and the factors that impact populations. Um, there are human demographers, and of course there are demographers who study other types of species. A common uh, device that's used is what's called a life table. And the life table looks at different particular cohorts and sort of what, what's happening to those cohorts. In particular, it focuses on mortality. And so you can see here, these are these ground squirrels, and these are the different cohorts at any given moment of time. There's, of course, some that were just recently born and some that are really, really old for a squirrel. Ten years old, I imagine, is really old for a squirrel. And uh, they're following through time a particular cohort so what you'll do is a bunch will be born one year, and you just follow that group through time, and that gives you an estimate of what happens. So this group that they followed through time, they started out with 337. Of course, all of them are alive at the start, so the proportion alive is one. But after the first year, there were only 252 left, um, and then finally 127, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so this tells you the number of deaths that occur, and the death rate, and you can use these numbers to calculate the average life expectancy for any given cohort. Um, you can see it's a fairly steep drop off, so the average life expectancy is not terribly old. It's only one of them made it to this ripe old age down here, and that was amongst the females. You can see the males, it's even a little tougher, they don't live quite as long. Um, so, a life table just gives you a look at particular species and what's happening to them at different co age age groups. Uh, it can also incorporate um, um, fertility, how many babies they have, and sometimes in a life table, although this one doesn't show that. Survivorship curves, these are another way of looking at populations. Um, so what you'll see with these squirrels is, so you've got the age on the x-axis, number, um, remaining uh, on the y-axis, and so you can see there's this fairly straight line decline, a little steeper for the males, and um, so again, they're all present at the beginning, but there's a fairly steep drop-off, and so by essentially five years or so, 
the males are pretty much uh, all that group of males are, are have passed on and by the nine years all the females have um, survivorship curves can be different shapes though so the squirrels have what we would call a type 2 survivorship curve a fairly linear decline and that is mortality as you can see is fairly consistent throughout the various stages of life now with a type 1 survivorship curve which is what humans generally have and there are some other species as well is early in the earlier life stages you have fairly low mortality that is most individuals survive and mortality doesn't kick in for the most part until much later in life and a type 3 survivorship curve are species who have high mortality at the early stages but then those individuals who make it through those early stages of course live the normal lifespan now this is relative lifespan you might say it's so it's not saying squirrels and mussels live the same length as humans but it's just saying that um, in humans most individuals live a fairly long life squirrels consistent mortality and in these muscles here there's a high mortality at the beginning but then there are of course some that live the normal length of lifespan for them survivorship curves um, now we talked about life history a little earlier uh, and in previous videos and in, in class discussions there's some general patterns here as you might be able to surmise individuals with a type 1 survivorship curve they have high survivorship early on that's in part because they have a significant amount of parental care in those young they tend to have fewer young whereas individual where species with type 3 survivorship curve they're types that tend to have lots of offspring with little or no parental care and so therefore there's lots of mortality mortality amongst those young but they make up for that mortality by just having so many young um, that's a general trend you see in these types of species um, so indeed here's sort of a different type of life table if you were looking at fertility and so this one's again showing the different cohorts and um, it's showing the females of course because they're the ones that have the babies and the yearlings the, the ones that are zero to one eight years old those females don't have any offspring at all but but when they get to be one year older they start having offspring and so it's the proportion of them who are having offspring. So you can see by the second year and beyond, the vast majority of females are having offspring. Um, and here's the, the average number of offspring they're having. You can see they reach their max fertility at about years four to five. Um, and then it starts to drop off as they get older. Um, so there's fertility life history again we already talked this about this a bit um, and so life history can come in various forms um, again it encompasses the lifespan um, number of times you reproduce um, this is a I, I, I'm not sure how to remember these terms I'm sure if you took some Latin you would know a little better but semel parity these are species that just reproduce once and die so insects for example a lot of them just reproduce once and then that's it iteroparity i guess iteration you could think iteration means many times iteroparity these are species that reproduce multiple times throughout their life humans being a good example um, in plants there's different terms plants that exhibit this big bang reproduction are known as monocarpic and plants that reproduce multiple times those perennial plants they are polycarpic so here's a century plant the type of agave that only reproduces once in its life but it produces lots of offspring has this big reproductive output um, so it would be um, monocarpic these terms semel parity and iteroparity apply more to animals um, all right so let's see, we'll skip that skip that okay Again, uh, reproductive output can vary. You can have the strategy again of producing lots of offspring, like this dandelion, or being this coconut and re producing relatively few offspring, but there are a lot bigger seeds. There's a lot more food in that seed for the embryo that will develop out of that. Um, 
and uh, let's see. <clears throat> so let's look at how we can um, mathematically model the growth of populations. Um, and so, of course, the simplest form is, again, you're just looking at the births and the deaths and immigration and immigration so that births and immigration add to the population, death and immigration take away from the population. Um, and so, as we said, when those things are sort of equaling out and the population is at equilibrium, you'll have zero population growth. Um, and here's a simple equation. This, this dn over dt represents change in numbers in a given unit of time. And the change in numbers is a function of first how many individuals you have that you're starting with and this value r, which represents the rate of growth. Um, and that rate of growth is a function of births and deaths, immigration and emigration. Um, exponential growth of a population is um, when it's growing quite rapidly. Um, and so this equation essentially mimics um, exponential growth when you're at your maximum rate of increase and that's when you're going to get the maximum change in numbers in a given unit of time and that leads to this kind of shaped equation or shaped curve again depending on what your rate of increase are the value are you start out with a relatively small population but before too long it goes through a rapid increase exponential growth large population size now, of course, in the real world, this does not go on forever. Um, populations don't just grow on for go on growing forever because there are limitations to this. Again, it can happen over a short period of time, but there is ultimately a limit. Um, and so, now we bring in what's called the carrying capacity, and that is any habitat will have a carrying capacity for a particular species. How many individuals? of that species it can support and carrying capacity is abbreviated with the letter K. Um, and so now we modify our exponential equation just dn over dt equals r times n to the logistic equation and it's going to incorporate the carrying capacity. So essentially um, when you have a population size that exceeds the carrying capacity, you tend to have negative growth rate and it comes back to the carrying capacity. But when you have a population size that's smaller there in the carrying capacity, you'll have positive growth approaching that carrying capacity. Now you can see there's a big difference from here and here. Essentially, as we'll see here in a minute, when you have a small population, you can have relatively rapid growth, um, a high rate of increase, um, but as you approach that carrying capacity, that rate of increase will tend to slow down. And so now here's our modified equation with r times n, and now we've got the carrying capacity in there. And this is what's known as our logistic equation. You're going to want to know this for the exam, and we'll, we'll practice this a little bit in class. Um, so, now what, what I want you to notice is that when the carrying capacity, let's say the carrying capacity for a particular species is a thousand, and let's say the population size is only a hundred. So essentially, this side of the equation is going to be, what, 0.9 at that point? And you'll be pretty close to your maximum rate of growth. But as n gets closer and closer to k, let's say, again, carrying capacity is 1,000. If, if, if the population size now is 999, this side of the equation is essentially 0, and your change in numbers is going to be 0. You have reached your carrying capacity.